The residents began chanting the names of their heroes and expressing their congratulations on the victory. Another system window appeared for each resident, displaying their total reward. While the maximum reward could have been 300 points, a 25% penalty was imposed due to the destruction of one of the bases, leaving them with 225 points. However, the rewards didn't stop there. Individual rewards were also provided, based on residents' contributions such as raiding monsters, defending bases, and defeating afflicted creatures. The residents, many of whom had previously lost hope, couldn't believe their ears as they learned about these rewards. It seemed as if they were experiencing something akin to a video game, and in front of them, a store interface appeared, offering the ability to purchase various skills, items, equipment, experience points, and most importantly, medical treatment. This unexpected boon was warmly welcomed by the afflicted and wounded residents, offering a glimmer of hope and improvement in their lives. The news of the in-game store and its treatment options brought joy to the thousands of wounded citizens, especially those in the local hospital. They had the opportunity to choose treatments from the in-game store, with prices as follows. 10 points for healing all wounds, 10 points for purification to cleanse all abnormal negative effects, and 10 points for regeneration to restore lost body parts. Choi Yul was also happily browsing the store, pleased that even the injured could now receive treatment. However, a sudden turn of events left everyone in disbelief and confusion as their points vanished. The system window provided an explanation. It was due to the sovereignty sacrifice effect, which involved additional conditions. These additional conditions were as follows. If 10% of the residents were sacrificed, Choi Yul's reward would be doubled. If 20% were sacrificed, it would be tripled. And if 90% were sacrificed, his reward would increase by 100 times. Notifications revealed the top earners, with Choi Yule leading with a staggering number of points. The townspeople's initial disbelief turned to anger and despair, and they confronted Choi Yule with a barrage of questions and threats. Sergeant Quan Jiayong and Go Hyeju intervened to prevent any harm to Choi Yule. Quan Jiayong urged Choi Yule to stay calm and focus on healing the wounded while trying to find a way to share his points with others. Choi Yul was willing to help, but when he attempted to do so, he received a notification that his passive skill, monopolistic desire of Demon King Krishina, prohibited him from giving items or points to others. Frustrated and under immense pressure, Choi Yul attempted to burn the cursed book, but it materialized again when he tried to access the store. His efforts to share his points or provide aid to others were thwarted by the book's mysterious abilities, leaving him and the townspeople in a state of desperation. Amid the chaos and anger of the crowd, Choi Yul's impotent rage led him to pound the cursed book with his fists in frustration. Someone in the crowd begged him for ten points to help a dying woman, and cries of desperation spread among the people who had once trusted him. Threats of harm and death were directed at Choi Yul, and his friends watched him in bewilderment. Sergeant Quan Jiayong received a report from one of his subordinates, about increasing casualties and furious citizens. Meanwhile, Choi Yul desperately tried to find a way to help others, but the cursed book continued to thwart his efforts. The situation grew more volatile as anger and indignation among the citizens escalated. A tense moment unfolded as Quan Jai Yong held an automatic rifle to the back of Choi Yul's head, informing him that he had been arrested. Before we continue, take a moment to answer the question of the day. Fire powers or water powers? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. Now, back to the recap. The angry crowd demanded that Choi Yul surrender all his points, with some even suggesting that he be killed. Go Hyeju, however, urged the crowd to remain calm. In a surprising turn of events, Quan Jiayong leaned over to Choi Yul and advised him to run away, find a way to make things right, and seize his only chance. Choi Yul clenched his fist with determination, opened the game store, and began buying dexterity characteristics for points. In the next moment, he jumped into the air at great speed and disappeared, leaving the crowd puzzled and shocked. As people began to realize what had happened, anger erupted, and they condemned Choi Yul for taking everything from them and fleeing. However, their complaints and curses couldn't change their situation. System windows displayed information that there were only 24 hours left until the next move, leaving little time for rest and preparation. In the midst of the chaos, Go Hyeju stood resolutely in the street, while a man on a dais addressed the gathered citizens, giving them the choice to stand on the left if they wanted to fight, or on the right if they wished to evacuate. The fate of the city and its inhabitants hung in the balance as they faced the impending challenges of their perilous game-like world. Choi Yul's words echoed through the crowded evacuation center, a place filled with uncertainty and fear. As he addressed the gathered survivors, he emphasized the importance of vigilance and compliance with the established rules. It was clear that the stakes were incredibly high, 
and everyone's survival depended on their adherence to these guidelines. First and foremost, he stressed the need to check their status window regularly. In this new, treacherous world, this window provided vital information about their current condition, abilities, and resources. Ignoring it could mean the difference between life and death. Leaving the evacuation center without permission was strictly prohibited. Choi Yul reminded everyone that venturing out on their own could expose them to unknown dangers lurking in the perilous city. Safety protocols were paramount, and only authorized missions outside the center were allowed. Additionally, it was crucial for everyone to remember the locations of temporary bases and other evacuation centers scattered throughout the city. Knowledge of these safe havens could prove invaluable in times of crisis. One of the most critical rules laid out by Choi Yul was the immediate need to flee upon sighting a mysterious individual known as Choi Yul. The urgency was emphasized by the directive to cover one's ears as they fled. This enigmatic figure seemed to be a harbinger of danger, and reporting his whereabouts to the authorities was paramount to ensure everyone's safety. Furthermore, if anyone happened to hear advice from Choi Yul about an impending raid, they were instructed to isolate themselves until the mission was over. This suggested that Choi Yul might have insider information or connections to the ongoing crisis. Amidst this solemn address, a silhouette appeared in the background, drawing red circles on the ground with chalk. This person was none other than the protagonist, Choi Yul himself illustrating the rules for all to see. As the rules were announced in the town square, a sense of eerie calm settled over the crowd. It was a stark reminder that this was not the world they once knew. However, amidst the uncertainty, there was a collective determination to survive in this perilous game. The townspeople's reactions were varied. The military worked tirelessly to develop tactics, while some individuals focused on personal strength training, hoping it would increase their chances of survival. Others waited in long lines for groceries, a reminder of the basic necessities that still needed to be met in this dire situation. Tensions flared as fights broke out, and some sought solace in the church, clinging to the hope of salvation. Each person coped with the new reality in their own way, but one thing was certain, a new move was on the horizon. In this high-stakes game where millions of lives hung in the balance, the players had to strategize carefully. The town, known as Pawn 8, was the stage for these unfolding events. It was time for them to make their next move, as dictated by the system's window that appeared before them. Their mission, to destroy all the demonic pillars and defeat their guardians. Failure to do so within the allotted five days would result in the summoning of the dreaded Demon King, a catastrophic outcome they all desperately wished to avoid. The tension in the air was palpable as the survivors contemplated the immense task ahead. Three demonic pillars stood as obstacles to their survival, and their success or failure would determine the fate of Pawn 8 and its inhabitants. The first demonic pillar they were faced with had a relatively low-level defender, a being known as the Fallen Angel of Fate. Despite having two pairs of wings that bore a superficial resemblance to an angel, the Fallen Angel was far from heavenly in appearance. His unsettling visage sent shivers down the spines of those who gazed upon him. He roamed the city, endlessly searching for his elusive destiny. The second pillar's guardian was named Mad Brains. This metallic entity had a physique resembling a praying mantis, with an enormous head filled with protruding brains. According to the system's information, Mad Brains was a relentless creator, constantly engrossed in crafting various things. The more time he spent on his creations, the more ingenious they became. However, the third pillar's protector posed a significantly greater challenge. This defender, known as Goblin Swordsman Jack, had a difficulty level of three. Unlike the previous two, Jack was no pushover. He stood before a massive crystal with a burning red core. The ground where the pillar once was now replaced by this imposing structure. Despite having a humanoid build, Jack's skin was an eerie shade of green. According to the notification window, he was a swordsman goblin who had mastered martial arts and undergone a formidable body transformation. His goal was to break the seal of the Demon King and challenge its might. Amidst this revelation, Choi Yul remained on the ground contented with the circles and text he had meticulously drawn on scattered pieces of paper. A subtle smile played on his lips, hinting at his involvement in the unfolding events. Meanwhile, Sergeant Quan Jiong, who was holding a walkie-talkie, received an urgent message that the civilians had launched an attack. Attempts to control them had proven almost impossible. Determination etched on his face. Quan Jiong decided that it was time for their military team to take action as well. He turned to Go Hyeju, seeking her input on the matter, but there was no response. A fellow soldier informed him that she had departed, leaving Quan Jiong pondering the chaos that had disrupted their once perfect system and cooperation within just one day. The world had shifted, and survival now hinged on confronting these formidable demonic pillars and their protectors. With the fate of Pawn 8 hanging in the balance, the players faced a daunting challenge that tested their resilience strategy, and determination to make it through this perilous game. Amid the chaos of the impending battle, 
a determined young woman, spear in hand, confronted the third-level defender sitting nonchalantly beneath the towering pillar. She assumed a resolute fighting stance, her eyes locked onto her relaxed opponent, who emitted a serene blue aura. Go Hayaju's resolve was unwavering. With unparalleled determination, she surged forward, activating a newfound ability that caused her hair to glow a brilliant golden hue. In her hands, her legendary level spear gleamed, ready to strike with deadly precision. In the blink of an eye, her weapon reached its target, resulting in a thunderous explosion that reverberated through the air. To her astonishment, the defender remained unscathed, seemingly unaffected by the tremendous force of her attack. He effortlessly intercepted her spear, as if it required no effort on his part. With a graceful movement, he deftly swung his sword, sending the girl hurtling backward through the air. In the next moment, he raised his sword, which radiated a vibrant blue light, and brought it down with such speed that it was imperceptible to the human eye. A white streak of light appeared before the girl as she hung in mid-air, seemingly cleaving her head in two. A colossal explosion resounded through the city, accompanied by a shockwave of blue aura. The goblin defender, who had been sitting beneath the pillar, looked up for the first time, wearing a mildly bewildered expression. Not far from the scene, someone landed on the ground. It was none other than Choi Yul. He cradled the surprised Go Hyeju in his arms and gently placed her on the ground. In a decisive tone, he instructed her to inform his comrades that he intended to claim all the rewards for himself. Annoyed by his audacity, the girl retorted that it was already apparent, leaving her behind as he made his way toward the pillar where the protector sat. Choi Yul added one final warning as he departed, advising her to convey to her people not to cross his path if they wished to safeguard their rewards. The girl opened her mouth to respond, but Choi Yul swiftly conjured his book, signifying the end of their conversation. The enigmatic figure continued on his path, his actions and intentions shrouded in mystery, leaving the girl to contemplate the astonishing power and presence he wielded in this perilous world. In the blink of an eye, Choi Yul's book materialized in his hand, its pages open and ready. He proceeded toward the pillar, his mind filled with contemplation about the limitations imposed by the game's mechanics. As he pondered, he couldn't help but acknowledge that there was no way to refund experience points to players nor any escape from the looming threat of the Demon King. Damn book, he muttered, addressing his thoughts to the status window. In response, the system window opened the in-game store, informing him that his level would increase by one point for every unit of characteristic he allocated. It was a daunting prospect, but Choi Yul was undeterred. When Go Hyeju inquired about the specific numbers needed to increase his skills, Choi Yul smiled enigmatically. He replied that he intended to max out everything, a statement that triggered a series of bewildering notifications on the system window. These notifications were not exclusive to Go Hyeju, but reached all those ensnared within the game. As the messages spread, it became evident that Choi Yul had become the first player to reach level 100 in multiple characteristics, including stamina, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, luck, and health. This revelation stirred fury and resentment among many players, who realized that Choi Yul's rapid ascent had been at their expense. Surrounded by a radiant golden aura, Choi Yul marveled at his newfound strength and questioned the system about the number of equipment dice he had received. The system promptly informed him of the staggering total, 432,512. Hearing this, Choi Yul wasted no time. He ordered the system to discard everything below the magic class and to automatically roll the dice for any equipment above heroic class. In response, the system revealed the outcome of Choi Yul's decision. 142 pieces of legendary class equipment, and 1,230 heroic items. In the next moment, Choi Yul received a notification that the system had tagged all the items he had acquired, forming a radiant cylinder around him. This cylinder emitted a brilliant light and displayed holographic windows showcasing the array of weapons and equipment he now possessed, a testament to his extraordinary progress within the perilous game. As Go Hyeju looked on in shock, her eyes wide with amazement, goblin protector beneath the pillar displayed a happy smile. He saw in Choi Yul a worthy adversary, and he relished the prospect of a formidable fight. Determined to make the best use of the hard-earned rewards and the power of the Demon King, Choi Yul, armed with the finest equipment, held a sword in one hand and an open book in the other. Choi Yul silently resolved to protect the city at all costs, a personal mission to atone for his past sins. He didn't care if he faced judgment or insults from others, this was his path to redemption. Remaining seated under the pillar, he listened to the system window's updates while goblin swordsman Jack began to smile, preparing for the impending battle. A surge of intense aura enveloped him, reflecting his excitement at facing such a strong opponent. However, to the goblin's surprise, Choi Yul, equipped with heroic-grade magical air shoes that granted flight-like abilities fueled by mana, 
interrupted the anticipation. He stated that he didn't have time to play right now and swiftly ascended into the sky, promising to return soon. Go Hyeju couldn't help but wonder if Choi Yul would truly leave, her gaze shifting between the goblin swordsmen, who remained seated, and the rapidly departing Choi Yul. With incredible speed, Choi Yul maneuvered between buildings, leaving only residual images behind as he approached the first pillar's defender. Since goblin swordsman Jack hadn't initiated an attack, Choi Yul left him untouched for the time being. Sensing the impending danger, the fallen soul angel protector turned to face Choi Yul, but it was too late to evade the swift kick that struck him squarely in the face. As Choi Yul looked down at the defender beneath his foot, he realized that his first task was to battle the other defenders. Despite the people's angry and vehement shouts, demanding Choi Yul's demise, he continued his relentless assault on the first pillar's protector. In the blink of an eye, Choi Yul moved with lightning speed through the sky and the city's buildings, his sword in hand. He recalled what he had read in the book. The unique traits of the pillar protectors could be activated if certain conditions were met. These traits introduced vulnerabilities to the defender, increasing the likelihood of defeating them. However, Choi Yul also realized that if the wrong conditions were met, strong and challenging traits could be unlocked, making victory even more elusive. Dodging Choi Yul's attacks, the angel protector swiftly counterattacked with clawed hands, that proved to be formidable weapons. In the case of this specific defender, killing 100 people would transform him into a fallen angel capable of annihilating humanity and becoming significantly more powerful. Choi Yul, determined to succeed, drew his sword and swung it forcefully, severing the angelic bird's wings. He recognized that his first step was to eliminate the guardians with inconvenient traits and unlock those essential for their mission's success. The battle was now in full swing. Choi Yul's every move carried the weight of millions of lives hanging in the balance. With the Angel Guardian plummeting to the ground, its wings now severed, the protagonist wasted no time. Accelerating with the aid of his magical boots that allowed him to walk on air, he pursued the falling creature. His thoughts were focused not solely on the completion of the mission, but on how it was accomplished. The method mattered just as much as the outcome, a notion that weighed heavily on his mind. Meanwhile, on a road pockmarked with numerous holes and cracks, a military truck rumbled forward. In the cab, Sergeant Quan Jiayong, known to us from earlier, conversed with someone over the radio. He relayed orders to maintain a minimum distance of 500 meters from the pillars, as they were uncertain about the purpose of Choi Yul's intervention. As Quan Jiayong finished relaying the message and glanced out the window, he pondered whether Choi Yul had found a way to return the rewards, or if he had chosen not to do so at all. Recollecting the time he had spent with Choi Yul, he noted that the man was not inherently malevolent. Still, Quan Jiayong decided not to base his judgment on emotions alone. Considering the incredible power Choi Yul had demonstrated, he recognized that someone with such intelligence and strength could potentially rule an entire city. Even Go Haiju, who had spiraled out of control, might be a valuable asset, along with Choi Yul, if they could work together to accomplish their mission. Quan Jiayong's thoughts were abruptly interrupted by a thunderous explosion that rocked the area right beside the military truck. The shockwave was so powerful that it sent him tumbling aside like a feather. Disoriented but determined, Quan Jiayong emerged from the wrecked truck and surveyed the scene. He paid no heed to the concerned soldier asking about his well-being. Instead, his gaze fixed on the source of the explosion. There, standing atop the defeated guardian angel's body, was an imposing figure. In one hand, he held a sword, and in the other, he gripped the angel's halo and wings, the spoils of victory. Quan Jiayong needed no further explanation. The sight before him spoke volumes. The arrival of this formidable individual had changed the course of the battle, and Quan Jiayong was left to grapple with the implications of this unexpected turn of events. As expected, the formidable figure was none other than Choi Yul, and the sword he wielded was called Divine Divide, belonging to the legendary class. In its description, a legend was mentioned, one that spoke of this sword as a fragment that had once divided earth and heaven, and even created the world. However, in its current form, it had lost much of its power. Nevertheless, it possessed a unique ability to transform the severed parts of monsters into usable objects. Sergeant Quan Jiayong expressed his astonishment that Choi Yul had managed to defeat the Pillar Protector single-handedly, admitting that he hadn't expected to encounter him here. Choi Yul responded with a mere smile, offering no words in return. With a sudden leap into the air, he vanished from the sergeant's sight. Quan Jiayong, interpreting Choi Yul's actions as devoid of malice, felt reassured by the encounter. However, one of the soldiers behind Quan Jiayong grew fearful and began to speak, pointing shakily at the fallen pillar protector. 
His trembling hand and urgent words were abruptly interrupted by the sergeant's confident voice. Quan Jiong believed that the soldier was merely startled by the protector's death and suggested reporting it to command. Little did he know that the soldier's fear was not unfounded. The system window that appeared moments later conveyed a message confirming the fulfillment of the conditions for the special trait, which required the removal of the wings and halo from the fallen angel. However, the outcome of unlocking this special trait was far from what they expected. Instead of empowerment, it led to a grotesque transformation, distorting the fallen angel into a nightmarish creature, one without destiny. Ugly and disfigured body parts began to sprout from the once angelic defender's head. Over time, an entirely different creature emerged, resembling a dinosaur. Before the stunned eyes of Sergeant Quan Jiayong and the ordinary soldier stood a spoiled beast with a difficulty level of two. It was a creature that had lost faith and fallen into sin, no longer under the protection of the divine. Contemplating the bizarre transformation before him, Quan Jiayong couldn't help but reflect on the challenges of a warrior's life. His musings were interrupted as reinforcements arrived in the form of five armed men, each carrying a machine gun. With the situation growing increasingly complex, they now faced the daunting task of dealing with this unexpected turn of events and the formidable creature that had emerged from the fallen angel's transformation. Sergeant Quan Jiayong swiftly assessed the situation, recognizing that the three monsters they faced in this mission were likely as formidable as an entire raid. As he opened fire on the pillar defender, he couldn't help but wonder if Choi Yul had intentionally left them to deal with this monstrous foe. The newly arrived reinforcements joined in the firefight, firing upon the creature. One of them contacted headquarters, requesting additional support and providing their current location. The pillar defender, seated on top of a building at the time, suddenly propelled itself off the wall at breakneck speed, launching itself toward the group of soldiers with its enormous paw outstretched, attempting to inflict damage. Fortunately, the soldiers managed to evade its attack unscathed. However, surviving the encounter did little to quell their panic, and they quickly succumbed to fear, fleeing the scene, leaving Sergeant Quan Jiayong alone to face the relentless monster. Equipped with a helmet designed to mitigate negative emotions that could hinder clear thinking and combat effectiveness, Quan Jiayong watched his comrades scatter in terror, their pleas for help fading into the distance. His teeth clenched in frustration and anger as he made the decision to retreat, luring the monster away from his frightened comrades while continuing to fire at it. He knew that he had to hold out until reinforcements arrived. The monster, significantly faster than an average human, accelerated toward him, opening its terrifying maw as it closed in. Sensing imminent danger, Quan Jiayong turned to face the oncoming threat, but it proved futile. In the next instant, the pillar's protector brought its massive paw crashing down upon him, resulting in a pool of blood forming beneath the impact. Choi Yul, witnessing the gruesome turn of events, threw his book into the air with a sense of resignation. He closed it with a calm smile on his face and muttered, Great, I got one. Simultaneously, a brilliant green light radiated from beneath the monster's paw, where the sergeant should have been crushed. The sudden transformation left the monster bewildered. In the next moment, the paw was forcibly thrown back by the radiant green light, forming a barrier of sorts. Emerging from the area where the sergeant's lifeless body should have lain, a hand holding a green flag ascended from the ground defying all expectations and leaving both the monster and Choi Yul astonished by the inexplicable turn of events. A message suddenly appeared in the notification window, announcing the fulfillment of the conditions for Hen's hidden helmet skill. The figure leaning on the flag, standing on one knee, was none other than Quan Jia Yong. Despite being covered in blood and appearing on the brink of death, he held an assault rifle in one hand and the flag in the other, muttering something to himself. The activation of the hidden skill required two conditions. The first was being on the verge of death from a dark attack or a spoil strike, and the second condition mandated that the helmet's owner had to be the leader of a group of more than five people. The resulting skill was known as the Spirit of Heldon. Upon activation, the wearer became possessed by the malevolent spirit of Heldon, an inquisitor of heretics. In the next moment, the spirit's image materialized behind Quan Jiayong, bathed in a green light exuding a powerful aura, bearing a resemblance to Suzan Nu. The skill's duration was limited to 10 minutes, during which all equipment and skills were imbued with divine power, significantly enhancing defense against darkness and spoilage. Additionally, the wearer entered a fanatic mode, experiencing increased attributes in attack, defense, and recovery. They became immune to emotions, losing their sanity and attacking all monsters of darkness and corruption. Upon witnessing Quan Jiayong's survival and his newfound power radiating from him, the monster was taken aback. Quan Jiayong continued to mutter in a fanatical manner, but the special skill's benefits did not end there. In the next moment, 
The system reported the activation of the fanatic skill for all members of his squad. A distinct pattern appeared on their foreheads, and their eyes turned green. They shouted fanatical phrases and fearlessly charged toward the monster, displaying unwavering courage. Choi Yul, observing this from above, couldn't help but shiver. The spectacle before him was even more terrifying than he had imagined, as the transformed squad members confronted the monster with newfound zeal, driven by the power of the Iron Club. Before the commencement of their impending battle, Quan Jiayong found himself recollecting a crucial moment. It was a memory of his interaction with the battalion commander, a conversation that unfolded as an unexpected offer materialized. The commander had presented him with the opportunity to acquire a car, a gesture that struck Jiayong as remarkably generous for a mere sergeant. In response, Jiayong candidly expressed his reservations about the magnitude of the offer. To his surprise, battalion commander Kim Song responded with a smile commending the soldier's boldness and forthrightness. Despite the commander's praise, the ensuing small talk only intensified the awkwardness in the air. Nevertheless, Commander Song proceeded to delve into the pressing matters at hand, revealing the unsettling lack of intelligence regarding their current situation. In such challenging times, he emphasized the need for their force to function as composed observers. This role, Commander Song noted, suited Quan Jiayong perfectly. In addition to the calming effect of the hen's helmet that rendered Jiayong composed in any situation, the soldier possessed the courage to protect those under his care. Transitioning back to the ongoing battle, Jing's squad relentlessly bombarded the beast with bullets, displaying unwavering determination. Amidst the chaos, Quan Jiayong's mind echoed with the earlier conversation with the battalion commander. His contemplation persisted until the ammunition ran dry. However, driven by fanatic determination, Jiayong rallied his squad to charge towards the looming pillar. The weapons bestowed upon them by the mysterious dice were further augmented by the blessing of the Iron Club goddess. Jiayong, wielding his divinity gun, prepared to swing it with precision. His comrades, too, exhibited newfound skills, such as the divinity Bayat skill, and wielded a divinity flag to pin down the corruption beast. In a climactic surge of effort, the five soldiers successfully subdued their formidable opponent, each roaring in triumph and dedicating their feet to the Iron Club goddess. The momentous victory was broadcasted to the entire city, catching the attention of Commander Song. To his astonishment, the leader of the triumphant party was Quan Jiayong, reinforcing his discerning eye for identifying potential in individuals. Meanwhile, the self-assured protagonist, with a broad smile, reveled in the realization that his strategic approach had paid off. By draining most of the Guardian's stamina and strategically involving Quan Jiayong's squad, he had orchestrated a pivotal role in the defeat of the beast. The protagonist also deduced a valuable piece of information. The Guardian's stamina remained unchanged, even if it transformed into a new form. Drawing on his experience in the battle, he recognized that when monsters underwent transformations, the contribution of the previous damage dealer would reset. Armed with this knowledge, Quan Jiayan's squad emerged as the primary contributors to the beast's defeat, ensuring they would reap substantial rewards for their triumph. Shifting his focus from the victorious battle to the aftermath, our protagonist decided to engage in a conversation with Jack, the goblin sorcerer. Jack, sporting a perplexed expression, found himself in uncharted territory as it marked the first time a human genuinely conversed with him. Undeterred, Chor Yul continued to share his thoughts with Jack, expressing a hint of frustration at the Guardian's inability to communicate. Nevertheless, he found solace in having someone to listen to his tales. As the exchange continued, Chor Yul boldly proposed a bet to Jack. He declared that if he emerged victorious against all the Guardians, he would even break the Demon King's seal. This audacious statement created an atmosphere of intense pressure. Such claims couldn't be made lightly. However, the Goblin felt a sense of possibility, believing in Chor Yul's capacity to fulfill this formidable challenge. Meanwhile, on another part of the map, a flaming spear swung with precision, landing devastating blows on the anti-human machines with a level 1 difficulty. The flame dragon goddess executing these slashes effortlessly obliterated the machines. Go Hyeju, responding to a rescue call, arrived on the scene only to realize her stamina was dwindling. The battle seemed unending, with machines continuously appearing and receiving mysterious upgrades. Despite her resolve to end the fight before things escalated further, the relentless speed of Guardian Pillar production posed a significant challenge. Go Hieju commanded those near her to retreat, concerned about the rising danger. However, her pleas fell on deaf ears, as many believed she sought to hoard the rewards. Desperation drove people to rush towards the machines, eager to gain points for potions to heal their loved ones. Among them were two individuals strategically positioned behind a tower, readying their crossbows. The duo benefited from a set effect that amplified their damage 
based on others wielding similar gear. Before they could release their attacks, the head of the Mad Brain Guardian abruptly turned towards them. Catching them off guard, frozen in their positions, they faced a powerful beam of energy directed at them. Fortunately, Go Hieju intervened just in time, using her legendary spear to deflect the attack. However, the sheer power of the beam left Go Hiju visibly struggling. A colossal explosion reverberated through the area, unveiling the extent of Go Hiju's injuries. Her clothes were charred from the powerful attack, revealing the severity of the perilous situation they now found themselves in. Before we continue, let's take a moment to shout out Era Ara Simp, who commented, Demon Energy, on our Killed by Eldest Brother video. Thanks for commenting! Maintaining her composure, Go Hieju prepared to instruct the others to run only to find that they were already fleeing and calling for help. The unexpected turn of events lightened the mood, prompting Go Haiju to chuckle momentarily. Meanwhile, the Mad Brain Guardian had fixed its gaze on Go Hieju, initiating a thorough analysis of her status, user level, attack patterns, and more. Once the analysis was complete, Mad Brain went into action, creating a new machine specifically designed to counter Go Hieju. Recognizing the imminent threat, Go Hieju resolved to stop the machine at any cost. However, the Guardian was one step ahead, alerting all deployed machines to converge on Go Hieju's location. Undeterred, Go Hieju adeptly deflected the onslaught of attacks, seeing an opportunity in the chaos. Seizing the moment, Go Hieju unleashed more of her power, causing her eyes and hair to turn a fiery red. With all the machines gathered near her, she cast a powerful flame attack, swiftly defeating every single one in one fell swoop. Urging those nearby to evacuate, she then hurled her spear into the sky, signaling a powerful impending attack. As the spear traveled, its flames intensified with each passing second, targeting the Mad Brain Guardian. In a blink of an eye, a blinding explosion engulfed the area, showcasing the sheer power of Gohiaju's assault. The force of the shockwave sent the crowd fleeing from the tower, propelled by the explosion's impact. Amidst the chaos, Gohiaju observed an unexpected sight powerful shield that had effortlessly deflected her all-out attack. The tower and the pillar guardian remained unscathed, with the new machine inside the shield revealed to be the AGM, anti-Goyu machine. Resistant to fire and equipped with Dragon Slayer weapons, the AGM was a formidable adversary focused on detecting and pursuing Gohieju. The revelation of this upgraded machine added a new layer of complexity to the unfolding battle. As Gohieju's eyes widened in realization, the AGM had stealthily approached her, launching a powerful strike that sent her reeling. Fading into unconsciousness from the accumulated damage and exhaustion, she glimpsed a familiar figure, Choi Yul, emerging and swiftly executing a lethal slash atop the Pillar Guardian. Confused and dazed, Go Hieju questioned the unfolding events as her vision blurred. In the midst of this, a powerful beam from the AGM targeted Go Hieju, aiming to fulfill its role in defeating her. However, upon reaching her fallen position, all it encountered was a patch of blood. AGM system, sensing the absence of its target, activated its tracing senses, determined to locate Go Hieju. Meanwhile, the Pillar Guardian, having lost its head, experienced malfunctioning wires throughout its body. Unexpectedly, the system revealed the activation of an unlocking trait called the Mad Order. This trait initiated the repeated crafting of the last machine created, doubling the manufacturing speed and quantity produced. The area quickly became flooded with these relentless machines, their production showing no signs of stopping unless the main unit was destroyed. What will happen next? Find out next time by staying tuned for our future recaps. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more great recaps.